probably one of the best characters I ever came up with, and he might even still be on the air, is Little Sweet. He wasn't even supposed to go to the meeting. When we brought it up, it was like everybody in the room didn't even really want us to show it. And when we showed it in the room, the Dr. Pepper clients lost their marbles. They were laughing so hard. I guess the story there just mainly is that just no matter how many focus groups we did, how many big conversations I had with the CMO, is just the need to constantly be inventive so that you can make this thing happen because we knew we had something special. I mean, it, it's been going for like seven years and it like tripled their sales. Um, but it, it's not like it was done after that meeting. It was yeah. only the beginning. And then it was like, we had to fight for it every step of the way. Well, welcome back everyone today. I'm very honored to be joined by Mr. Brett Craig. Thanks hello, for joining hello, hello. me. Yeah. Quick How's introduction on you. Although you've got a long list of accolades. Wow. Um, it, you worked at T. BWA, Chiat Day. Yeah, Chiat Day. Chiat Day. Shiat yeah, day. but everybody does say that. And in fact, Ashton Kutcher in the movie about Steve Jobs said it the way you said it. Like, almost sounds like S H I T. All right. And that's not what it is, but everybody says it that way. Okay. And you were the creative director there for things like PlayStation 3 ads, um, and you helped launch WAMU. Yeah, um, Pepsi. Yep. Yeah. things like that uh then you were the group creative director um oversaw pepsi call of duty mm -hmm. um and tostitos tostitos which is yes. an odd mix of yeah of that different one didn't companies last long we had a talking chip bag and the client was always iffy on it and it just sort of flamed out after like three weeks so. yeah well <laughs> you gotta try things you gotta try it yeah maybe the talking chip bag would have worked um, and then you were the executive creative director and chief creative officer at Deutsche LA uh, for Taco Bell, Dr. Pepper, uh, Diet Dr. Pepper, 7-Up. Um, you came up with things like Lil Sweet One, Fansville, um, some big names like that. So lots of fun. And then you uh, moved on from there or maybe moved on um, from, from Deutsche LA. That's a whole story. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you did some freelance work, including daily wire. Um, you helped do the, the greatest commercial ever. Um, and the, That's right. Well, and I, Jeremy boring, gets the, 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 the real credit cause it's ultimately his spot, but, yeah. but I get, I did title it the greatest commercial ever, which, you know, Jeremy would agree with that assessment. So. I, I think he was, he was pretty happy with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then did work for BIG studios and now you are the chief creative officer at XXXY. Yeah, so it's been quite a journey. Yeah. I guess the first question is, how have you managed to fit all that in? 25 years, I guess, is the answer, the short answer of just, yeah. I mean, I and I never had any intention of this career path. It's just I started at my dream shop, really, at TBWA, Shia Day, which, which had Apple and where I ran Pepsi and stuff. But um, I was there for 12 years, and I never intended on moving, and I remember... It's like in your career, you kind of discover that like at some point, the velocity just kind of mo runs out. You'll know it. Right. Same thing. I mean, um, you're working in a company right now, working for your dad. Um, but yeah, just sometimes things just start to move to a place where you're like, you can just feel that it's time to move on. Or, or it could be more sort of curt and a radical stop like it was for me at Deutsch. But these new chapters open. So anyway, I've been, been at quite a few places. I mean, some people dance around more than me, but I'm probably somewhere in the middle, like four or five different things. Yeah, and, and all over the, con the country, correct? You know, not really. Re well, lately. I mean, LA to start, uh, TBWA Shite Day, then Deutsch LA, and that was my career. I mean, until 21, and then out in Nashville after that, and sort of working remote now. Yeah, is yeah. Nashville the new LA? Because it kind of feels like that a little bit. Yeah, I always tell people it's kind of Hollywood, central, you know, the middle of America, Hollywood. It's an entertainment town, uh, entertainment industry in the middle of the country, which makes it kind of different and kind of kind of cool. And I, I think that's why I ended up there. Yeah. Because I always tell people like I'm a you know I'm a Christian, I'm conservative, and in LA you could you can kind of pick where you want to live, and there's communities around LA that are kind of whatever you're into you can find it. And if you want to dip into the thing, into Babylon, <laughs> if you want to go into the heart of Egypt and, and L.A. and check it out, which I kind of enjoy all that stuff sometimes. I just don't want to live in the middle of it. Right. Nashville's the same thing. You can, you can kind of live out in the country and jump into Nashville and kind of experience all the cool artistic things, you know. It, it, it's interesting, and you didn't ask this, but like I like, I like progressives 
making art. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like them making movies and food and, and like just stay away from government. So I like what they do w- sometimes with cities. Not everything, of course, yeah. but, but some things are cool. Like right. the art, art, people that are artistic are fun to be around and it appeals to me on some level. So I like being close to Nashville and LA because there's a lot of inspiration in those cities. And so. How was it raising a family in LA? You know, again, you can find the community that fits you in LA. So I, it's not so, it's not bad. You know what I mean? Like I, I think now it's gotten tougher. I would say during COVID, many, many people you talk to will tell you that it got dark and I don't know that it ever came out. You know what I mean? What I, what I mean by that is people see you coming on the street, you're both wearing masks, they get off and move to the other side of the street. Um, that vibe kind of was only in certain parts of LA, like I would say like Venice Beach, let's say. People just didn't seem happy there to me. That unhappiness seemed to kind of fall over the whole city during COVID and I exited and I don't really know what it's like now, but when I talk to people, I hear that that's still kind of the vibe, that it, it never was that way. LA was always kind of a happy place um, where you were just free to be yourself, but I, I felt oppressive when I left and I, some people tell me it still feels like that. How did LA become the center of Hollywood, the center of film basically across the world? Well, you know, it's interesting you ask that because so what I, I shot there for 25 years and one of the things that was crazy is I rarely ever had to leave LA because every single thing you could want, whether you want to be on the moon, whether you want to be uh, in the mountains, you want to be in the, the mid- middle of the desert in Africa, it's all there. I mean, every kind of ecosystem or background you can imagine, right? And this is before the big LED walls and all the effects. Yeah, within an hour of LA, you can be in 8,000 foot mountains or you can be at the beach and make it look like Hawaii. So I, I think a lot of it was just, it is the perfect place to create almost any backdrop for a movie. Um, you could be anywhere in the world as long as you're in LA because it's got so much within two hours of the city. Yeah, it's such a diversity of landscape. Yeah, and then it's so pretty. You add the weather, and then, of course, people like it for that, and the beach, and the next thing you know, you've got the media capital of the world or or the, the center of all film, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your experience like working for companies like Deutsche LA, TWBA, Shot Day, those as a kinds of things? Or just in general? In general, like... As far as yeah. those are very high performance companies in the middle of Los Angeles. Well, it was a dream to be honest with you. I mean, cause when I came up in the business, the only thing that we asked ourselves is, could we make our clients famous? Could we create ideas that had their own velocity inside of them because people just wanted to watch them. They just wanted to be delighted by them, wanted to share them. And so Shia Day for me was that agency. I mean, they did the Taco Bell dog. They did the Mac versus PC stuff. Um, I could, I mean, they've done so much famous work. One of the top three agencies probably, you know, of all time. Um, so it's just pure joy working for them and getting to work with Lee Clow, uh, who was Steve Jobs kind of right-hand man at, at Shia Day. Um, so it's just amazing. And then getting to go to Deutsch and do the same thing and probably do the best work of my life actually at Deutsch rather than Shia. I went there and, Ironically, I think at that time, Deutsch was starting to do um, even better work than their cousin, you know, one block over because we we're literally one block apart. Yeah. So it was just purely fun. I just, I loved it. I just, I loved the environment. I loved the people. It was just a bunch of, we used to always say it was a bunch of stand up comedians all next to each other in the creative department. Everybody's weird. Everybody's got their dog with them. Everybody's wearing shorts. Everybody's, Everybody's a mess, <laughs> but it's fun. It's like in a weird way, it was, it was just complete fun. What's different about people like Lee Clow as opposed to, you know, your average creative person at a low level company? I, Lee is like a water diviner. You ever seen like the, the rods? It's, a, it's kind of a famous thing where they go out in a field. I don't even know if they work really, but it's kind of a legend. Yeah. Your water diviner will point to where there's water or like an oil you know, a, a meter that knows where the oil is underground. Lee can walk into a room full of ideas and it's like, he just goes right towards the thing that is best on the wall. And it's amazing. Like, and take something you had over here and place it next to something over here, which is, by the way, Think Different, one of the, the biggest computer campaigns of all time, from, you know, or for any computer or brand or tech brand was Apple Think Different, which is famous. Like you'd probably a little bit oh, yeah. old for you, but it's still just beautiful work with Muhammad Ali and 
Anyway, Think Different was, he saw Think Different on the wall, Lee, and then he saw some black and whites of geniuses like Albert Einstein, and he went, those are the two things, you got to put those together. They weren't together on the wall. So that was his brilliance. He could walk into a room and just look at a wall full of ideas and find the idea in two seconds. And he was, he's special. He's probably one of the greatest advertising creatives in history. Yeah. If not the best. Yeah. Why'd you choose to go to ads and not movies? Yeah, I think I wanted to go into movies, but I think it was this sort of notion that um, you could get into advertising. And in, a, and in a lot of ways, you would be working with the same people. And so film is so hard. Hollywood's so insular. Everybody's got a screen play in LA. It's like Nashville. Everybody's got a song they're trying to sell. Like yep. You, yep. Just, you learn that when you're in these towns. And so, yeah, and advertising in a weird you're you're shooting i mean the one of the greatest considered the greatest ad of all time is 1984 with my boss lee clow um ridley scott shot that i mean ridley scott's one of the greatest directors of all time in hollywood i mean he's i think a new aliens is coming out and he's the producer on it but you work with all the greatest you work with the greatest editors the guy that did cut fight club and the, you know it's it's crazy like how the talent you get and you can get in reasonably if you're gonna have to want it real bad um but you could get in. Whereas Hollywood, I mean, I, I just feel like you could, you could beat the pavement for 20, 30 years and just not get in. Yeah. You know, it's just tough. It's a tough business to break into. Yeah. What, do you have any good stories? This is kind of a, an odd question, but good stories from times at Deutsche LA or TBWB, TBWA, Giant yeah, Day. Maybe one that's kind of fun is just, and in, in you and I are making something together right now, is just the constant challenge of the creative process when it encounters headwinds. And when I say that, it's like when you come up with an idea, I used to tell my creatives, you've only started down the road. Now the job is, right? You've got this idea. It's in your head. The client likes it. Now, how are you going to steer it and defend it all the way through the process? Because it's going to encounter headwinds. It's going to encounter obstacles. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest thing for young people in the business. And so one of those obstacles for me was one of my, probably one of the best characters I ever came up with. And he might even still be on the air is little sweet for diet. Dr. Pepper little sweet. Didn't even, he wasn't even supposed to go to the meeting. Little sweet was a goofy idea. And it was a third campaign that we showed Dr. Pepper. And when we brought it up, it was like everybody in the room didn't even really want us to show it. Even the, the account people, you know, the people that work on the, count side of the business were like this is crazy this is this little tiny man what is this all about and when we showed it in the room the dr pepper clients lost their marbles they were laughing so hard that it was like even though we were there to recommend a different campaign it was like after that reaction i mean you got to go with what you saw right but all the way through that process we were challenged with who is this character it was encountering issues from an ethnic standpoint, which you, today is very tension filled in, in America. And it was encountering uh, questions from other standpoints of just the brand of Dr. Pepper asking, is this character right for us? And I guess the story there is just mainly is that just no matter how many focus groups we did, how many big conversations I had with the CMO uh, at the time, is just the need to constantly be inventive so that you can make this thing happen because we knew we had something special. I mean, it, it's been going for like seven years and it like tripled their sales. Um, but it, it's not like it was done after that meeting. It was yeah. only the beginning. And then it was like, we had to fight for it every step of the way. And, and also when I say fight for it, it isn't just saying no to the client or just saying no to the, to the obstacle. It's how do we creatively solve the thing that you're critiquing? Sometimes the critiques are stupid and sometimes they're not worth listening to, but sometimes right. clients got a point. And so how can we, how can we solve the obstacle that you've, or the challenge you've put to us on this character, on this creative? So the, the funny part, I guess, about that story is a little sweet. I mean, he, he, even after I shot that character, this is how much the, it's how much the world didn't want him to become a character. Our own agency tried to kill it. <laughs> So the client bought it, you know, there's just like kind of an inside baseball, but there was so much nerves inside of our own agency that our own agency tried to get rid of the idea, which just was shocking to me. And then finally, what actually stopped that was pretty funny, was that essentially the head producer at our agency basically went to the head honcho that wanted to kill it at our agency. He said, you can't kill it. It's the clients. They paid for it. We went and shot it. 
you can't kill it. You're like, your client paid for the ad. It's their asset, theoretically. So it was just, that was one, that's probably one of the best ideas I've ever had and my teams have ever had that we made together. Like I was the guy that kind of added to it, like, little sweet, you know, when he comes in the room, yeah. coming in on a segue. Like that was my idea. Um, and the it, singing made it brilliant. Yeah, and we almost got rid of that. See, that was another thing. My creators were like, I'm not sure about the singing. And I'm like, oh, you got to keep the singing. And it's just, this is the creative process. And I guess the biggest point of that story is that story continually plays out your whole career when you're in any kind of creative world, particularly when you're collaborating with other people, right? Like I am with you guys right now. There's lots of opinions. And your job is to somehow steer this idea between all of that and come out the other end with something everybody's going to be proud of. And that's not easy. Yeah. And admittedly, it is a strange idea <laughs> of like, let's have this tiny little man dressed up as like a cheerleader, basically, yes. that yes. runs around and right. sings in a high-pitched voice. Right. Well, and if you look at it, I mean, at one point, that's really funny because the client called me one day and he's kind of a real manly guy. And he's like, hey, Brett, this little sweet character you got, I need to know that he's a real man's man. <laughs> and I said, well, I said... He's a man's man like David Bowie, man's man like uh, Mick Jagger, you know, man's man like uh, Prince. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> you knew like it's a rock and roll archetype, you right. know, and when we watch yep. rock and roll, men all look at rock and roll lead singers and we're mystified. Why do girls find that attractive? Because it's like we think being muscular and, and for some reason when a guy has a guitar. That's, that's what the guys find attractive. <laughs> yes, we the other guys with big muscles. That's, that guy's strong. That's what I admire, but girls feel differently. So anyway, uh, it's just pretty funny that yeah. what what catches on. But you're right, it's a hard character to sell. But how do you come up with ideas like that? Yeah, I don't know, man. Where do the ideas come from? I mean, that's a really good question. And when you don't, when you're looking at a white paper, and I'm sure you've done this, sometimes you're like, where is the idea going to come from? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I, you know, often resort to praying to God and saying, God, I have a white sheet and I'm having no inspiration. Could you help me? Uh, that doesn't, that happens to me quite often, but a lot of times it's just like, you know what it is? It's like, um, I always say to people, you glimpse something, something in your mind, something that just gives you a little goosebump, something that makes you chuckle. Right. And you don't have the whole picture yet. It's, uh, I don't know if you ever experienced that. Like, I don't know what kind to of. do with that yet. Yeah, like you had it and it's gone. Almost. Yeah, it's almost gone, but it, you might retain a little piece and you're like, there's something there. Like, why am I seeing this little character? But, but you have them wrong maybe in the beginning. I, I tell people all the time that like, for me, great ads and great ideas are a little bit like a puzzle that's been thrown out on the floor. So like, if you ever put a big thousand piece puzzle together, some pieces come together pretty quickly, right? right? Some of them are even connected in the box still. You know, those are those early thoughts that make yep. sense. But, you, but what happens is you don't know what to do with it. It's like, I have that little puzzle piece. I have that idea, but it's not connecting. How does it connect to everything else? How does it connect to Pepsi or Red Balloon? And so I have to kind of set it aside and keep assembling things until all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that piece, it just slides right in now. Because it was something special, that idea. But it needed, you know, it needed a little more of the picture to come together. So I find that's how it happens for me. It's just start with a little bit of inspiration. Sometimes I'll even play music. Like, honestly, like I'll just listen to tracks sometimes when I'm making commercials and just find myself feeling something and then going, what would be cool to put to that? Um, so there's a lot of ways you can yeah. get there. Do you chase the, the feeling? Is that what you're trying to identify and bring to life? Or is it more um, something that you think would directly associate with the brand? Well, it's like the two things are essential, right? If you create something that's brand on brand, but it has no feeling, you're, you have nothing. If you create something with a lot of feeling, but it doesn't connect to your brand, you have nothing. So it's how do you make those two things overlap? I've got to give people the feel, some kind of feels. I got to make them either cry. I got to make them laugh. I got to give them the chills. I've got to, uh, I got to do something. Feel, if you don't feel anything, that's, that's when you're in trouble. That's the worst feeling when you're in an edit bay or when you're looking at film like we were this morning and you don't feel anything. Um, and sometimes, and you usually can find ways to fix that, but it's, it's scary when you don't feel something. So you got to feel something. And then I think you got to find a way to make it strategic. It has to be something that, yeah, like directs you back to the brand. It has to make logical sense. I think that's why advertising especially is, I always found it as a neat art form because it's one part logic, right? Like, Pure art can just be you walk into a museum, right? And you've done this, I'm sure. And you're like, what are they doing? Yeah. Like the guy put 
buttons on a painting or I don't know, you know, whatever, put crushed Coke cans. Or that guy that put taped a banana to the wall. Right. And was like, this and you're is, just like, this is so dumb. Someone ate the banana. Right. And you, really and, entertaining. Uh, and it's like so much art is like that. In the past, art was not like that. It was like, in, you know, back in the you know, Middle Ages, church, the church was responsible for a lot of art. And if you look at it, it has a purpose. I mean, David is David and Goliath. I mean, in Michelangelo. So it's like, you go into the, even if you go to the Vatican and you look at all the stuff on the wall, there's a purpose in those beautiful paintings that Michelangelo is painting. He's telling a story. Advertising is a lot like that. You're telling a story. Whereas a lot of times artists think they're telling a story, but you've made something that nobody can interpret. So advertising kind of has to be strategic, has to have a real message that you can pull out of it, and it has to have great artistry for it to work. Are you, are you going to add anything? It does feel like people have become slightly less creative in the past, call it 20 years. Um, maybe that's just because we keep seeing recycled movies. Um, it feels like no one either has the guts to go try something new or they just can't come up with anything good. What, what's happening there? I would argue that the craft of filmmaking, like Netflix and some of these, you know, Amazon, the explosion, Apple's got their own thing. I, you know, the longer burn television shows, I think the craft has actually gone up on the storytelling. If you look at television shows from my childhood in the eighties, I mean, it's bad. I mean, it's like bad sitcoms. I mean, they're cute and I have all this nostalgia for them, but it's not right. good. It's not good filmmaking. Yeah. So I think the craft has in a way gotten better um, in terms of, and I think the true creativity has gone to the Netflixes and it's gone out of the theater and it's more alive in those long form television shows or whatever you Netflix. Yeah. Um, I think it's there. I think that what you said, 20 years, I would actually say in the last five to seven to 10 years, we're in a much worse place creatively. And I think that's the rise of the woke thing and the rise of the diversity, equity, inclusion, which is the same thing which is a limiter on what you can do. It's hard to tell authentic stories if you're trying to check the box on race and gender, and you're not just looking at a story that just resonates, right? Whoever, whatever the color of the person is or whatever the gender of the person is. Um, I think wokeness, you see what it's doing to Disney. Um, that's a very creative brand. It's never had a problem with creativity, but all of a sudden they're movies and everything's getting safe or un it doesn't resonate as real or good. It's, it's not out there enough for people to actually care. Yeah. Is, is kind of what it feels like. I mean, we had the, the accolade or acolyte, the new star Wars yeah, show yeah, that, yeah. Gay, that yeah. was trending because they call it the gayest star Wars ever. And it's right. like, that's not what people are looking for. Well, yeah. And I think that's part of it is like the market's not begging for that. That's a niche market. And in order to deliver that film, a lot of times you have to force the ideology into the script and it, and stories don't want ideology. They, they really don't. They want to resonate as authentic and true. And so, yeah, I think when Disney sends us girl, tough girl movie after tough girl movie or whatever, I'm not just using picking on Disney. Yeah. Hollywood gives us that. After a while, it just gets predictable. And it was in Kill Bill, you know, that's a, I didn't even see that movie, but I, I could see why Quentin Tarantino busted up the stereotype of who's tough. And then it was kind of interesting and it's kind of stylized and it was unexpected. But when everybody starts to do that, because we're trying to put women in positions of power and film, but it doesn't resonate because it doesn't resonate as, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. girls kicking people's butt in film. It's fun to watch in like an Avengers movie. But at some point, some stories, it's just not going to serve because we all know that can't happen. Right. It isn't going to happen. Yeah. And so you're asking me to suspend my disbelief. I can watch Mission Impossible and I can watch a, a, a Mossad agent or whatever, CIA agent kick somebody's butt or whatever, MI6 agent that's a woman. But at the end of the day, I know that's completely not true. It couldn't happen. Yeah. How much of what we, like, it's true that a, um, like a, is a general rule the woman won't beat up a man but you can suspend disbelief sure. how much is the creativity linked to the truth of the world and how much you know well i think there's times we want to suspend our disbelief and we want to watch a character that could never happen and but to an extent right yeah yeah no and i think i but i mean that's fantasy that's fiction that's science fiction that's superman it's wonder woman yeah. and i think that's great and it's fun and we should do that but you're right. Like when I'm telling lots of other stories rely on human truth 
and they need to resonate as true for them to be compelling. And that's what I mean by when we force fit ideology, which is what we're doing today in film and in advertising, the first thing the viewer says is, I don't buy it. This doesn't look like any family I've seen, or that's not a family I can relate to. And I know the other side will argue, well, we're always seeing your cisgender heteronormative characters and we want to bust that up. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I think a lot of times those characters resonate because it's more of our experience and movies are based on, on human experience. Yeah, and it's also like you have to have the normal for there to be the exception. Like if, you know, a girl kicks a guy's rear one time it's unexpected and so yeah. you like then you're suspending disbelief but it's if it's happening all the time it's you're lying to the people watching that this is what happens always i think so and like you just said i saw that movie the other day i don't need to see it again right and i know you're showing it to me because you have an agenda an ideological agenda and that ruins the creative surprise we all can begin to write the script for disney or whoever because we've seen this movie before right. and and that's why i was saying like wokeness diversity equity inclusion it limits your ability to think outside the box because certain thoughts are considered thought crimes and in order to be an, a great artist and great creative and i you know you have to be a bit of a thought criminal right you know what i mean and predictability kills it predictability in, kills in, it. in, a, in a way i mean it's predictable that the good guys will win and the bad guys lose and right right those th kinds of things right but the the magic of stories is you have the ordinary boy in his ordinary life who meets right. a dragon sure right you everything's ordinary until there's one extraordinary right. thing one extraordinary that calls thing, yeah. the boy on an extraordinary adventure but if it you have speaks to something about boys probably in the movie right something that resonates with boys yeah. and girls when they watch it because that feels true and if everything is like if it's a you know a magical boy in a magical world with a magical dragon you can't relate with it sometimes you because can, it's yeah. just everything is exceptional so there's no um you have to it's not that you're suspending disbelief. It's that your belief has flown out the window. Maybe. Or you could look at a Lord of the Rings and you could say, but the human tr there's human truth baked into the storyline so I can relate to that. Yes, Narnia doesn't exist, but I, I, I relate to the struggle inside of the movie and I get what it's trying yeah. to say. And I relate to like four, in I relate to a 15-year-old boy, yes. right? Yes. That's something I can understand. And I can understand that, you know, because because of my imagination, I can understand if I was challenged to fight a wolf yeah. with a sword, I probably wouldn't do great. Yeah. That's the kind of thing, yeah. because it's an, a normal person. Yeah. One other thing I would just say, and I was kind of going there, is that as creatives, as artists, you have to break the rules. And artists are notorious for that. So it's really interesting because I'm not Catholic and I have no interest in Catholicism, but I did go to the Vatican. And when I was there, I remember the tour guide sent, or somebody, it was either my history teacher or at the Vatican, I remember, looking at, and I saw this, it was pretty funny, Michelangelo hated the Pope. And so the reason he hated him is according to the story, I think, is I think he just didn't like him, number one. But imagine you're this brilliant creative. That's what he is, really. Brilliant artist. Yeah. Painting the Sistine Chapel, right? And you got this guy who's, you know, over the top of you, the Pope. And, and he, I think he re all creatives resent that <laughs> on some level, having a boss of any kind. They just want to be artists. And I'm sure that was part of it. But my understanding was too, that the Pope had gone around and covered up the genitalia on the statues that Michelangelo had made. And he wanted to show the statue, like human form as it was. That was his perspective. And they, so if you go th around Florence and you go around Italy, you'll see a lot of leaves over that because the Pope had those leaves put on. Mm -hmm. And so this is just funny to me because it means that artists have always been this way. He was so annoyed with the Pope that he drew him with donkey ears. And you can see it. Look it up on the internet. You'll see a, a Pope with donkey ears on the thing. And so he kind of hid it and it's still in there. And it's, that's the, the legend behind it is that he hated the Pope. And that's why he did that. That's <laughs> Isn't that great? That's I love funny. that. Yeah. But that's creatives. But that's There's creatives. There's a little bit of rebelliousness inside of all creatives on yeah. some level. Yeah, you know, and I don't mean in a bad way, you know, because we don't want to be. But even like I look at Jesus, and it's like there's a good rebel inside of him, a rebel to this world a little bit, the system that's telling you things should be a certain way. Um, he's that way too. I question what you're telling me, and it kind of and it kind of mimics the world that we see around us. Is like it's not like everything's kind of falling in chaos, yeah. and you're just trying to like grab bits and pieces of it and make it all fit together. Sure, yeah, um, sure, and so a creative loves the chaos basically.
Yeah, and I think also doesn't like rules. Doesn't don't tell me how to paint the painting. Don't tell me I have to look like this. When you start to confine me, I feel the the mental shackles coming on, and that's death to creativity. Which is why so many creative people are gay or trans things like that. Is. I think there is a definite connection in the. I don't know what things going on in brains of people, but whatever wires make people creative often seem to to be other wires involved there. And, you know, even for me, like I'm as straight as they come and, uh, you know, Christian and conservative and, but, you know, I, I can appreciate the humor and I don't know the, the creativity of those folks. And, and, you know, sometimes it goes off the, the wrong direction, but yeah, but yeah it's, uh, it, it, I'm probably a rare type of creative <laughs> because most of them because are not you're, conservative. You're grounded. <laughs> you got a family. Yeah. Yeah. You got a family, you got yeah. kids. Well, because I think almost creative-minded people, maybe it just can take you down roads where, you know, if you're not careful, you know, it's like that creativity can lead you the wrong direction. Yeah, and there's also, I think, probably a part of it, as we were talking before this, of like, you know, when you um, get married, you're tied down, and it means that you can't up and move to Italy for six months on the spur of a moment. Yeah. Right? You have to... You have obligations that come before yeah. your creative obligations. Sure. Yeah, no, that's and true. I'm sure that's unattractive to some people. Yeah, I think marriage can look like settling down to a creative. Like, if you notice, like, a lot of creatives, it's the tortured artist, right? Mm-hmm. It's like Pablo, what was his name? Uh, Escobar? No, not Pablo. Uh, Picasso? Pascaso cuts yeah. his ear off. That's the old joke, right? It's like all creatives are tortured. They do their best work when they're upset. They do their best work when their heart's broken. And so they're almost going to become a romanization of being broken up, of being alone, of being on drugs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you notice that in, Hall, in like rock and roll, that is immortalized. That's romanticized. Kurt Cobain died of an overdose. Like people kind of, you know, so Jimmy, Jimmy Morrison, I guess, from The Doors. I mean, it's artists seem to revel in their pain. It's like a badge of authenticity. Yes. Yeah. And they think it gives them, it makes their art better. And the question is, is that true? You know, you know, because I don't think that's how we're supposed to live. And that's mm, not. I, no, I know that's not how we're supposed right. to live. And I don't think you have to do that to be artistic. And I'm pretty sure that God made the world in a way where you can be creative and not be on hard drugs. Yeah. And I don't even mean that. I mean, it can even be like you just think being brokenhearted and from one relationship to another. And sometimes it's involving drugs. And depression is when you do your best art. I'm the moody artist. And it's like you deal with a lot of creatives like that now. Yeah. Where did that original creative drive and uh, strength come from? Because we, like, I feel like we did used to be really creative. Are you talking about some, it in me? No, I'm saying, well, in your in yourself, but also in generally life. In, in, in life and specifically in America. Um, I just think we're creative beings. I mean, the, the if you think of what is God at the core, he's a creator. I mean, he it's what he's in the business of doing. I make all things new. I'm always making things. I'm making water into wine. I'm, I'm making an earth out of nothing. You know what I mean? Like, if you think about him, like he's in the business of creating. I mean, you look at animals and you're just like, what an amazing thing that you've created. So I think God is a creator at heart and, a, and, and the ultimate painter, the ultimate creative. And I think that's been placed in, if we're in the reflection, if we were made in the image of God, then I think we are naturally creators. Yeah. How do we get back to that? Where we were, where we realized that and were creative because of it for the right reasons. Because you feel like we're off the track. I do feel like we are off track in, we create for our own selves instead of creating for others. I know. I guess that would be the one thing is that like, um, if I recognize God as the, as the source of creativity, which he is, and um, and the source of my own gifts, then I have an obligation to use them and to use them responsibly. Um, so to me, and I can't apply that to a non-Christian because they don't believe what we believe. But for me, what it means to be, is, to, is what I'm doing now. It's like, I was making creative to serve the world at one time. I was making creative at one time to sell tacos. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but- but some of my ads I would be ashamed of now. 
you know, sometimes I did things to be salacious or to be, to get attention. And I would be embarrassed to, to play that stuff now because I was not using my gifts in service of God. And so I think the first step is, and again, we talked about all the great art that was generated, you know, in the, you know, the Renaissance and things like that. It was almost all Christian inspired art. You go to Europe, it's in a giant continent of Christian inspired architecture and art, Yeah, the cathedrals, everything. So the greatest works of art in the world, some of the greatest are Christian. And that's because Michelangelo or whoever these people were, you know, there's so many of them were waking up and trying to bring glory to God with, with the gifts he gave them. And so for me, it's that it's, in, is the thing I'm making something God would be proud of? Is the thing that I'm making something that I'm, I'm moving the culture a direction that would bring him glory? And I think that's how we get back on track. I don't think a Christian's going to do that. They're going to figure out how to make themselves glory, give themselves glory, right? Yeah. Um, and that's what most artists do. Right. How to make myself look cool. Or, and so I, I think I, I want to make sure that I'm never doing it for that. Yeah. Not to say I'm perfect, but I'm just saying like, what I ask myself, is that an appropriate thing to say? Is that the right idea? Um, is that moving the culture the right direction in a way that's more pleasing to God and more reflecting of who he is? So, How did wokeness get its foot in the door of the creative process? Because it's a business built on empathizing and feeling. If you think about it, like all creatives at the end of the day are feelers. We were just saying, you're like, well, is, it adds, or adds more logic or message than feeling. And I was saying they're both. Well, feeling is how those people go through the world. Advertising people and creatives, it's all about their whole life is feeling. And that's what makes them excited about living. It's how they operate. So when you wokeness comes in the door of feeling, right? If you think about the entire thing, it's um, about feeling bad for people. Everybody's got a raw deal. And I, and well, then, not everybody. The white Christian males are. Well, I guess my point is it got in the door because we, I presented you with a sad story about how certain people have no chance in society yeah, yeah. because of immutable characteristics. And if you're a feeling type person, you want, there's two sides to it. You want to empathize, right? Because you don't want to just shut down that story and just say, well, I, I, I don't care because I'm a feeling type person. I respond to feelings and you're telling me people are getting a raw deal. And sometimes I've even seen people get a raw deal. Right. So it resonates as true um, on some level. Um, and I think there's another piece to those feeling people, artistic people is just they're often narcissistic. And when, when I feel for you, I look good, right? So it makes me a virtuous human being to feel for you like to recognize that you have it so hard. And I, and that's what you notice, like that we call it virtue signaling. It, especially, and I hate to say it, a lot of white liberals want everyone to know how much they feel for people of color and feel for gay I people. I apologize for being white. Oh, yeah. I apologize. Oh. And that's, that's all about narcissism. That is not really a sincere apology. What that is, is you wanting to elevate yourself. When you bow down to BLM, that's about you. You don't care about BLM. None of these people care about BLM. You know, maybe some, or if they think they do. But at the end of the day, I don't think you really do care. Do you have, have you, like you go to the Christian church, right? How many folks in Christian church adopt people from all over the world that don't look like them? Do liberal, tons. do tons of liberals do that? Now, I'm not saying no progressives. I guess there are some that do. But you see a lot of that in the Christian church. And I think a lot of these people that want to, virtue signal and act like they relate to people of color, let's say, because that's the proper way to say it today, I guess, um, often don't even know any black people. They don't relate to that culture, really, right? It's all, it's just all for show. It's all for yeah. look at me. Look at what an empathetic person I am. Yeah. And interestingly, the people who are on the outside of the Christian church, the celebrities, many celebra celebrity children are trans or non-binary or whatever it is because it's, they're being sacrificed by usually their mother to this cult so that the mother looks good. I think you're making a really good observation. I think that a lot of that collecting of 13 children, which again, I'm happy that kind of happy that kids are getting families. That's great. But when they're collected as kind of like, look at me with my 13 kids, like a trophy, like a trophy and look at how they're so diverse. And even one of my sons is a girl now because I, you know, trans them. That's about you. You know what I mean? It used to be Hollywood people. The big thing they do is name their kids weird 
And that was about them too. Yeah, like Elon Musk <laughs> with XAE12 or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. it's like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, weird names. But now it's like, yeah, me letting that my child, you know, change sexes shows me, shows you what an open minded person I am. And that's about me again. Yeah. How do we kick it out? Because feelings are one of the bases, uh, bases on which um, the advertising world is built. Like you have to understand what people are going to feel yeah. and try to, you're trying to manipulate feelings. But how do we kick the wokeness out while keeping that? Well, if, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think what I saw in the sort of when the wokeness came in is one of the first things they needed to do was get rid of male leadership. So a lot of this movement is toxic masculinity, patriarchy, right? What is that all about? Well, it's about removing males from leadership because yep. when males are in leadership, then feelings take over completely. Not to say men don't feel, of course they do. But if that's all that's running our business is feelings, we're in deep trouble. Um, so to me, male leadership is essential, you know, um, in these businesses to be represented at the table, you just cast all that out of your ad agency. Then you don't even, you know what I mean? You don't have one half of the population's voice and it's a good contribution to the dynamics at work. Right. So like we, we women and men, both like complementarianism would, would be kind of the idea, which is that we complement each other. God designed us to complement each other and that we need both. Um, so I think wokeness is feminine at its core. And I've talked to a lot of people about that. It's just something I noticed one day. I'm like, this is a feminine ideology. Mm -hmm. It's feelings driven. It hates men. The only kind of men it'll tolerate is beta males. Yep. Um, and so I think one of the things is just men becoming leaders again. And some of that, I would just say, is our fault. And I've, I've thought about this too. Could this oh, ever, yeah. ever? Absolutely. Yeah, if we were leading our families, if we had been good fathers, if we had been, you know, and I'm just saying as a whole, not every man. Feminism doesn't have as much of a chance to take off. It takes off, I think, in the anger of women at the disappointment in their fathers. Their, you know what I mean? The things yeah. that have happened to them. Yeah, I saw, I saw a post which was nothing's more terrifying than a bored uh, middle-class white woman because she will inevitably, and this is not 100% true, yeah. but they'll inevitably find something to do that will, I mean, the Bible talks about the desire of a woman shall be to rule yeah. over her husband. Yeah. If the husband isn't doing his job and leading her and, you know, rebuking her when she needs to be, you know, guiding and directing her, yeah. then eventually she's going to kind of want to do that herself. And that's, that's where we are is just the men not having the guts to tell their wives no. And eventually their wives tell them no. Well, and I think too, and here's something to keep in mind, because I've thought about a lot about that as well. Like when men are leading well, what does Jesus's leadership look like? sacrificial yeah and he's on the floor washing feet he's dying for people that's what leadership looks like that is as masculine as it gets to lay down your life for your friend to lay down your life for your wife and your daughters when your wife sees that kind of leadership she i think her natural instinct is to submit to that is to interest because she respects that she respects it it's yeah. like oh you'd go in front of a train for me you would do anything for my girls or my son my maternal instincts are, that, that's what I'm looking for. What I, when I contend with you is when I don't see sacrificial leadership, what I see is just the harshness, maybe let's say. I, I, again, sometimes there is a need for correction, you know, and, and you two sharpen each other too. You know, it's like, I do think men are called to be the leaders and the spiritual leaders of a family, but my wife ha is so wise and we share in decision makings. Yes, she sort of says, hey, at the end of the day, it's your call, but, she doesn't mind that because I'm so interested in what she thinks. Right. I'm not making a decision without hearing what you want to do. And you marry a woman because you know that she's going to help you she and be wise wisdom. and with a counselor. Yeah. And, you know, Proverbs talks about the woman who is like the husband comes home and she's purchased a vineyard yes. and has sent servants out into it. Like the, in the industrious woman. Yes. I got a wife is, like that. Yeah. yeah. Who is, which fantastic. Yeah. Um, who is led by the, even more industrious man. Yeah. And I think when, thing. and when she sees that that man loves her and loves the family and sacrifices for the family, then, then leading is, it's just, it becomes very normal and natural and easy. And, but no woman wants to defer to a man who's addicted to pornography is leering at other women is 
drunk all the time. And you know, I, I'm just using those vices as examples because those are not respectable things. And no woman is going. She may say it's okay, or try to be like blow it off. But at the end of the day, it, it, on some level, she doesn't respect you. Yeah, absolutely. It's the it's the I'm not going to say no to myself, but I am going to say no to you. Because that's a whole lot easier. And like, you know, the husband who doesn't do any work and then comes home, like doesn't earn the respect and then comes home and bosses his wife around. That's the worst. Kind that's of, the worst. Yes. Because yeah. now you're asserting your male leadership, let's say, but you haven't, you haven't, you haven't earned it. And, you know, in the sense of leadership isn't just given, right? Like you're every leader, president, CEO of this company, Right. And every day you're earning that respect to be the leader. Right. It's not, it, you can have a title. Performance based. Yeah. But people are, you, I have to want to follow you. And if, again, I bring it back to Jesus, he's leading in such a way that people ultimately would die for him. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a special kind of leadership. It's not harsh. It can be when he's get behind me, Satan, but it, right. it's often. Dude, I'm on the floor washing your feet. <laughs> so who? that's what leadership is, which is I'm putting you first. Yeah. Who's not going to follow that? Right. And it's specifically attractive to men um, because it's that's the kind of thing that we automatically respect because it's the hard thing to do. Is you know, It's way easier to look down on everyone than it is to wash their feet. And so when you, when you, you, know, when you do have a king who's riding first into battle you respect that because he's the one who's gonna get hit first right and you know you're right you'll do anything for that person you'll yeah. go you'll go to war for that person yeah 100 percent. so i guess the question coming off of that is um is that one of the reasons why politics have also come into work is that we've taken seen like an overtaking of um or at least an overwhelming of the the masculine leadership at work and so now politics have entered as a byproduct of that we definitely have seen the politicization of every aspect of society in america and formally places that you would never touch politics one of those being advertising was one of the rules sex god politics don't touch any three of those because it's like rude right i'm pepsi and if i start talking to you about islam or Christianity. I don't know you. What are you doing? It's just you don't do that when you walk I into come, a room. I come to buy drinks. So yeah. I don't want I just got to know you. Hi. I'm already preaching at you. Like, even as Christians, we wouldn't do that. We would want to first know somebody, right? Right. Um, so you don't do that. So it has, we've politicized everything. And uh, why has that happened? I mean, I think it's because, I mean, my theory, I guess, is just that the left, the progressive left of America, which is anti God. Marxist, socialist, whatever you want to call it, but it's Marxist essentially. Yep. Probably a little bit fascist too. Like, you know, wants control over other people. Lots of ists. A lot of ists. Um, they understand that you have, you, that, well, they say, what do they say? The famous saying is politics is, per pol the politics are, are personal, I think. They say, I forget, there's a famous saying. The idea is politics should be in everything. They believe we have to politicize everything. And the reason is, is they want to ostracize a chunk of the country. Um, and it's working. Like they're you seen, have you seen Britain right. at the moment? It's right. full of like, right. and interestingly, I saw a clip this morning um, from Andrew Tate was on Piers Morgan. Yeah. Mixed character. Sure. But um, he was pointing out like, hey, you probably have more in common with the person you're out against, um, out fighting with a hatchet. Than, than with the person, with the politician, like with Keir Starmer, right? With the politician who's created the situation in which you are going out and trying to defend your home with a hatchet. So you have to realize that and stop rioting against each other. Right. You're just destroying yourselves. I agree. Well, I think, again, as Christians, then we can just like cut right through the veil of, and get to the spiritual reality. The enemy is a divider. That's how he takes control. Of a family, it's how he takes control of a company, it's how he takes control of a country. I divide. I divide people against people, and then I assume control. So politics come into everything as a tool of division, right? So I've got to get in the ad agency and divide it. I've got to get in the church and divide it. I've got to get in everything and divide it, and then I can, then I can conquer it. That's because, what Jesus said. Because chaos is necessary for change. Yeah, and division's necessary. Like, that's what you know, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And then right. Abraham Lincoln said the same thing. That is Jesus. 
It's not Abraham Lincoln. That was the creator saying to us, if you let division into your family, if you let it into your company, if you let it into your society, you're letting the enemy take ground. And that is exactly what's happening, I think. We can sit here and talk about you know, Kamala Harris or every bad idea that the left has, but all of their ideas are meant to divide. Right. And then call you divisive when you respond to it. <laughs> yes. Yes, call you weird. Yeah, you're weird. Um, how do we get it out then? I don't know any other way uh, to stop what's going on except for brave men and women to stand up to bullies. We're bullies being the, the progressive left is a bully. Is that yep. wokeness is a bully spirit. It is demanding you change your language. It's demanding you kneel. We saw it during BLM, people kneeling. It wants you to bow down and you cannot, you cannot do it. It's a false God. And so to me, um, the way you stop it, how do you stop any bully? You confront the bully and you don't care because you know, if that bully continues, a lot of people are going to get hurt. So at a certain point, you just put your face in front of it <laughs> and you put your fists up if you have to. Now, and what I mean by that is it doesn't mean we, we do violence. I don't mean that, but we confront bullies and refuse to bow down. Yeah. I saw a quote uh, the other day from, ooh, maybe J.D. Vance. I don't remember. But it was, um, we are America. We would rather um, die on our feet than live on our knees. That's right. That's kind of what you got to do. Yeah. I think like that bully spirit has to be confronted. It is, it's an evil spirit <laughs> of dominance over other people it, to hurt other people. Faux dominance. Cause there's no actual, like or rarely is there actual strength. Well, it's so, you know, wokeness for instance, uses social stigma to destroy you, yeah. which is some form of strength. It's just horrible. It's like, it, it's not physical. It's emotional. Strength. It's emotional and it destroys your status and your ability to earn in the culture, which is why it has such power over people. Cause people are trying to not lose their job. Um, so they're afraid to speak up about things like a man can't be a woman. But I just think that that bully spirit, I think it's a test from God. At a certain point, will you believe that I can go before you and, and defeat a bully? I mean, David and Goliath, what is he? He's a giant bully. Yeah. He's catcalling the Israelites. And when a little you know shepherd boy sees it and says, I'm not going to have that. Mm -hmm. it's like, We're not doing that. Because <laughs> right. I'm not afraid because at the end of the day, like I don't, I, this, is, this is my flesh. I don't really. We're yeah, all gonna die anyway. I'm gonna die, and I'm not gonna go out on like you said on my knees. Yeah. And I, and, and I think the God that I serve would be embarrassed, you yeah. know, of a man who says that he believes that <laughs> in the God of the Bible, who's infinitely powerful, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna heal to wokeness. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not doing it. <laughs> so how does the everyday, you know, Joe normal? deal with that how does he fight because obviously we can't go fight kamala harris right and stand up to her bully right but there is something we can do every day what is it i think we become that man in our, in our families that, that you said that we look at the biblical model for what a man's supposed to be and jesus is the perfect perfect archetype obviously he lived as a man supposed to live and it's not you know like i said it's not macho um although he's a man's man he's a carpenter i'm sure he was pretty you know doing his strong probably jacked yeah probably yeah all his, a lot of these guys that he was rolling with were all working class peter you know fishermen of course he had white collar guys like matthew but but so it's jesus as the model of masculinity no woman would dislike Jesus, you know, if they ever got to know him. Women liked Jesus. He took time out for women. He had a right. side to him that women very much were attracted to, and men respected him. So I think we go back to looking at him as, at him as a model and begin to exhibit that in our families, in our communities. And Jesus is not a coward. Jesus doesn't back down to people when they need to be confronted. He knows when to serve, which is what he came to do. But when there are bullies like the Pharisees, <laughs> Jesus, you know, occasionally pulls out a bullwhip, you know, one time at least. But in other times, he just confronts them verbally and says exactly what's going on. He names the dynamic. He doesn't allow them to bully um, other people. He calls them on it. Yeah. So I just think that's how, I, to me, that's what it looks like. It looks like being salt and light 
having courage, being like David. And when you see that going on in the culture, saying no. So find the bully in your in your day to day life and confront Refuse them. Refuse to kneel to it yeah. and be a part of it. Don't don't and don't perpetuate it. Yeah. That's the other thing is I think a lot of people are just like, well, I I I don't feel like I'm a part of it, but I, but you're also not doing anything to stop it. And I don't know how that looks in people's lives. And I think and I do want to be careful to say my story is different from yours. You know how I got to where I got is is I don't know your story and I don't know where you're at. I do think God sometimes puts Christians, you know, you see in the Bible all over the place, burrowed inside of Babylon, burrowed inside of Egypt next to Pharaoh Joseph. Right. Not all of us are meant to be at Red Balloon or at XXXY Athletics, clearly fighting the battle out in front. You know what I mean? And we've decided yeah. this is what we're doing. Some people will be Christians inside of the military, Christians inside of government. Christians inside of the advertising world. And I don't know how to solve each problem for those people because they're all nuanced and they're all different. But, um, but I do think you have to have some kind of, um, you have to have a line somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, like Daniel, I mean, he, he, you know, he, he, he would serve the Babylonians. He was in the court, right? He had his hair sh sh you know, shaved off. Some people think he had other things taken off because he's a eunuch. A lot of times they're eunuchs, which if you know what that means, a yes. lot of people think that that happened because yes. they would, they, they're a threat to the king, Str you know, men that are strong and smart like Daniel. So Daniel was, was, was okay with up to the line of where he felt it was violating God's law. You know what I mean? Like, right. and I, I'm not sure he was okay with the eunuch piece, if that's even true, but, yeah. but some people speculate. I think that'd just be a bummer all around. doesn't matter who you it are. It doesn't matter who you are, but I, but he wouldn't do it on his diet and he wouldn't do it when it came to prayer. You know what I mean? So there, were, right. there was a line where it's like, if you ask me to do this, I'm not doing it. Yeah. I'm not going with pronouns. Why can't I do that? Well, I can't affirm something that's a lie. That's a lie. I'm lying to everybody in this room that you need to know that I'm a man you can't tell and that I don't know you're a man. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. So there's just, you have to figure, I think as a Christian, I think the one thing I would say is, do you have a line? Is there anything you'll fight for? If you see your daughter playing against a boy in a volleyball game, are you just going to sit there? I don't know how it looks like to stop it. I don't know how it'll be for you, but are you going to just say yes to everything? Yeah. And interestingly, if you say that you're a Christian out front immediately, I was talking to Ben Merkel and he was um, saying that when he was younger, he worked in a restaurant in a diner and no one else there was Christian. Um, so they were, and they were all pretty foul mouthed, you know, yeah, sure. a little rowdy and, yeah. you know, um, and, he as soon as he got there he was like hey i'm a christian so i'm not gonna get drunk i'm gonna go to church on sunday um, don't invite me out to strip clubs all these things right i am a christian first and foremost and inter he found that the people he worked with like, complied with what he was doing where he, they were like, uh, if someone offered him a beer, like a new person in the restaurant walks in and offered him a beer, which happened, they were like, no, 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 don't offer him beer. We'll take the beer. Don't offer it to him. He's a Christian. He doesn't do that. And it also keeps you accountable. Yeah. Like if you say you're a Christian and then all of a sudden, you know, you've got the little black, black square in your Twitter bio, suddenly everyone's like, hey, what are you doing? I thought you were a Christian. You're not supposed to do that. So you're saying there's, it's important to be, out of the closet as it were like i think don't yeah hide it. Uh, if you if you hide it it can only like eventually it will come out and i think it's probably it's definitely better to have it come out on your own terms i am a christian right i am um i serve christ and i will not do anything that violates his law or that violates my conscience doesn't matter the situation and people generally respect you for that and won't really try to push that that far yeah, and I think it's actually an obligation of a Christian. You, you're, you can't hide it. Yeah. You're not allowed to hide it. Like, you have to be a light. And how can you do that if nobody knows what you are? Right. So you have to, you have to wear it, you know, and you have to do that. <laughs> and that's, you can't run away from that. Yeah, and that's <laughs> one of the other things with the lack of masculinity that's led to wokeness, in fact, is the lack of bravery, the lack of courage to stand up for what you believe in. And to stand up for what you believe in against people who aren't going to violently attack you, right? At, we're coming to a point where we may have to violently defend ourselves physically from an oncoming assault. But it's more the, like, 
the bad looks and the you know yeah. the emotional attacks and the just tr- manipulation and the little spiteful whatever it is not standing up for what you believe in because you're scared of that yeah like that can be a big driver or there can be and this is another thing i think christians sometimes do is they have they're ashamed of being associated with christ which if you're that's the case then you have to do some soul searching because you know he said if you're ashamed of if you have shamed him you know declare me before men I'll, I'll be ashamed of you right so something's stopping you from representing christ and whatever it is, fear of what man will do, that's a problem because you don't really trust God then. Because you don't, you really, you are, you're not, you don't believe he can handle what's going to happen. So you don't have, you really don't have a lot of faith. I mean, that's, I understand that when you're a Christian, we go through, we all go through that. The second piece is, is you, you're ashamed of Christ is another possible thing. And either one of those is like a big problem. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And if you don't have true men, you can't also can't have true women. And we've seen recently um, with the Olympics and some other um, Leah Thomas and others like him um, of men pretending to be women. It, women are under attack, which is odd as a cause of feminism. Um, what, why are they trying to take down women and women's sports specifically? We'll be out in just a second. I think we're okay. Thank you, though. Say again. Um, because we don't have true men, we don't have true women. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't have true women. So why are women's sports under attack? Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, I guess it makes sense to me on one level, which is just that if you weaken male males right to the point where they are not willing to stand up for their families or stand up for their daughters or right. Like you, you remove them from positions of leadership. They give up their positions of leadership because of the way that they're living their life. The inevitable outcome is that women are hurt. And I think that's part of what we're seeing. Yeah. Like there's not a lot of brave people to stand in front of that. Um, people are afraid of it. Yeah. And so they go silent you know, rather than do what you naturally would do is normally you would, you would stand in front of that train. So I think that it's all part and parcel of all the things we've been talking about is that we don't have a lot of courageous men and, and, you know, and it's left to some courageous women and, and some are doing it, but it's, that's a lot for, you know, women to have to tow that all by themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's XXXY doing to, to help that fight? Well, a number of things. One, I mean, we're the only sports brand we, we say that stands up for women's uh, sports, the only athletic brand. We're the only athletic brand that at this point will declare what a woman is. Yeah. I mean, those are two things no other brand will do. Yep. Nike will not affirm what, what a woman actually is. We will. Um, the name itself is, you know, harkens to the DNA reality that when you get down to your chromosomes, X, 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 y, everybody's X, one or the other. Right. And it, all the stuff you hear about... Um, genetic disorder there there are some there but, are some yeah. but it doesn't change the, the fact is you're an xx or an xy and you can have layered over that um some uh, abnormalities but your chromosomes ultimately come back so it, it, the point of that the brand idea is just again to reflect the the reality of science what we know about you know human biology um, so, and for me, you know, not everybody in the company would agree with this, but for me, it's a reflection of God's order. He made them male and female. Um, so we, we, our core idea is that we want to stand for truth and reality. And, and then I think there's this other piece of it, which is that women's sports have come so far. Right. And it's amazing when I was a kid, girls didn't, I mean, there was girls sports, but it wasn't like a big thing. Like not a lot of girls were playing, maybe a little bit soccer, um, tennis, some sports We had pretty good female followings. A female, and they had a pretty good, you know. Yeah. But it wasn't a like thing. There weren't surfer girls weren't surfing, right. um, skating. They weren't doing a lot of things. Um, it wasn't. I don't know why. Uh, it just wasn't. Society didn't really seem to. Now, girl, women's sports is becoming like a ph- you know a phenomenon. Look at Caitlin Clark. And so, part of the mission of this company is to protect the things that women have fought for and gotten, which is. 
a seat at the table of athletics that is almost is you know at this point I wouldn't say it's equal to men's in interest, but it's definitely huge. Way bigger than it used to be. Yeah, and growing. And so, but it, but if you, if we were to say now, um, men who identify as women get the same, get to come into those sports, and we already see in the very beginning of this happening, girls are being displaced, girls are getting knocked down, occasionally, sometimes girls are getting hurt. Um, that's going to erase. I mean, if this this continues within a few years, women's sports will be destroyed because. Even if it's just two people that identify as a woman in a track race, that's two girls that lost out. That's medals that they don't get. That's gold and silver. Get. Yeah, it's gold Generally. and silver. Yeah, I mean, it's like, so part of the, so the the company is going to push back and create space and make it okay for women to say, no, it, I, I'm not okay with this. Yeah. You know what I mean? And And that's our goal. And we want people, we want girls to be inspired because it's like anything in life. It's hard to say some things. This is a hard thing to talk about. Um, you know that it may cost you. You know that you'll be called some, you know, ist or phobic. But you have a right to say what you think about this. And when you see a brand like ours willing to go out and, and do that, it opens up the, the sort of the Overton window of acceptability for me to say it. Right. I'm not alone here. Like other people are seeing this too. And so that's what we want. We want the company to do ultimately. Yeah, courage is contagious. That's right. And um, you have an obligation to say it. Because if women are being beaten up, like the, the Me Too movement was real, and it there was a real problem sure. that was maybe addressed wrongly, but that men were beating their wives, sure. which was a horrible thing. Or sexual uh, harassment was right. a real thing in yeah. corporate America. And it was Absolutely awful. Um, and But you have to say, you have to like address that problem. You have to be a man about it and like go straight for it. I've, Stop it. You're not allowed. No, we're done. The end. Period. Right. End of story. You mean like on Me Too or on both? I, like on, on men um, coming into women's sports and, yeah. and beating them or, or, you know, with the Me Too movement, the original inception of that. It's, you know, it is the job of men to stand up and say, no, we're not Yeah, doing and also that. check other men and, and like say, yeah, you, can, yeah. yeah, you can't do that. Yep. <laughs> yep. Knock it off. Yeah. Yeah, knock it off. It's not fair. Yeah. yeah. As we wrap up um, here, we uh, I always like to ask, what's your biggest regret? Biggest regret, interesting. You know, I don't know that I sit around with a ton of regrets. And, you know, I think there are probably times in my life where, you know, I probably wasn't being used by God to do what he would want me to do. Taking my talents and not thinking first what he would want to do with them. Not, not saying to him earlier in my life, you made me do with me what you want. I think that's the place a Christian has to get to is like, are you willing, willing to say to God, whatever you want me to do anytime, any place, anywhere, I will do it. That's when I think the excitement and adventure begins when you were created, you know, for a purpose to do something good for him before time. Don't you want to do that? And so I would just say like, you know what I mean? I don't want to do anything else. I don't want to be on any other path. I want to do what you put me on earth to do. You're the creator. So my only regret would be just not figuring that out sooner. Yeah. What's your best piece of advice to anyone watching? Um, best piece of advice, like creatives or just creatives, creatives, anyone in general. I think one thing I'd say, cause I know you talked about find out what you love to do. Find out what God put you on earth to do. You, you have some passion inside of you. That's not an accident. Don't, uh, don't take a nine to five that you don't like. You know what I mean? Like when you're young, like pursue it, you get feelings over and your fire goes on inside of you. If you feel that, then that's a sign that God put that in you. And like, like Eric Lydell said in Chariots of Fire, I, I feel God's pleasure when I run. Find that thing. Because you can, especially in America, you can make a living at that thing. So it's going to be hard maybe. Then you'll maybe, have maybe only in America. Maybe only in America, yeah. In some cases, um, you know, there's a lot of jobs, yeah. That you, but you can almost do anything in this country, and so yeah, find that thing. Don't think that is an accident that you feel that way about that thing, and go and pursue it. Because then, if you do that, you work will be a joy. Yeah. And you will never ever ever have to pull yourself out of bed anymore. You you will race to work. And if anything, you've got to be careful. You don't have work take over your life because yeah. you love it. Elon Musk does not 
struggling to get to go to work. Yeah, as Dana White said, uh, wait, make a life that you cannot wait to wake up to. Yes. and Don't, don't and, waste your talents. Yeah, and you have that ability when you're a kid. And I think a lot of people will just sort of settle for the gig that pays me some money or I'm a lawyer because my dad's a lawyer or what, whatever. But like, don't do that. Like, find the thing that you love and then pursue it and trust that God can you know, dedicate it to him and then see what he does with it. Yeah. Where can people find you online? Twitter, I guess, yes, well, it's not Twitter anymore. X, X. at back37, I think, on, on there. Instagram, I think if you just put Brett Craig in, you'll, I forget, I'd have to look. If, you know, I'll put links in the description. Yeah, there I mean, I'm on all the things, except for TikTok. Yeah. And out of principle, I haven't been there yet. Same. But, but eventually, maybe I'd go there, too. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely, man.